Good afternoon, everyone. So welcome. Uh, this is now, I think, our third or fourth week of doing the Cardiac College uh, one o'clock uh, webinars. We're going to be talking about um, using sleep or focusing on sleep patterns as a way of um, improving your health risks, your cardiac health risks. So we're going to talk about sleeping well. Sleeping well is an important part of your, your overall health uh, patterns. And I think um, hopefully by the end of today's session, you'll understand what exactly you can do for yourself that would improve your risks from uh, poor sleep. Um, the presenters today are Mike Saren and myself, and both of us have had um, very strong interest in teaching people about the importance of sleep uh, at Toronto Rehab. And um, we certainly welcome this opportunity to um, bring some of the information that is out there. Um, and a lot of it has kind of accumulated across the last five or 10 years. So many times uh, medical doctors out there may not be uh, aware of some of these findings. And so hopefully this will help bring you up to speed with um, what is important for your heart health. Uh, in terms of our objectives, we want to look at how poor sleep affects you, not only in terms of your cardiac health, but also very importantly, in terms of your ability to think and plan and remember and do all the things that are important for us to do across the day. And as well, our emotional well-being. Um, having that sense that we can be calm and relaxed and, and deal with um, different challenges that we face. Uh, and sleep is very critical for all of those things. Uh, we're going to introduce you to two specific sleep problems, but they're not the only sleep problems out there, but they are two that are very important for most of our patients. So we'll talk uh, about both sleep apnea as well as insomnia and what the characteristics are of each, um, and then what you can do to um, deal with those challenges. <clears throat> and then before we finish, asking all of you to think about your own sleep pattern and what are the characteristics of it and how you can be better at uh, getting a good night's sleep, which in turn is probably your body's best natural doctor if you're sleeping well, you're activating all those wonderful things that sleep does to restore your energy and your well-being. So we'll uh, have a chance to reflect on that. Um, there is, if you go to your um, um, sort of icons, there is a question and answer uh, tab. So if you have any questions as we uh, are proceeding through this talk, please type those in and submit them and we'll try and handle uh, all the questions that are generated by the time we finish up today. And if we don't get to your question, uh, we will certainly find the answer and post it. So you're welcome to come back to the site and uh, find the answers there after. So we're gonna come back and forth. Uh, both of us will be presenting different parts of the presentation. We're gonna start with Mike. Okay, so in order to determine how common was the sleep deprivation or insufficient sleep? A problem is it's a problem in a population. UK Health Check study conducted a population survey of 13 countries and the question asked was, are you getting enough sleep? Here is the result. Most sleep deprived country was indeed over to the last slide, Jan. Most sleep yeah. deprived country was indeed UK with 37% reporting poor sleep, Ireland 34% and US and Canada were tied for third place with 31% reporting poor sleep. So it's a common problem, almost one third of the population. Next slide. Physiologically, Sleep deprivation affects many body structures and functions. It is a rather a busy slide. Now, central nervous system 
is the information highway of your body. Sleep is necessary to keep it functioning properly, but chronic insomnia can disrupt how your body usually sends information to your brain. During sleep, pathways form between nerve cells or neurons in your brain that help you to remember new information you have learned. Sleep deprivation leaves your brain exhausted so it can't perform its duties as well. You may also find it more difficult to concentrate or learn new things resulting in cognitive impairment. Sleep deprivation negatively affects your mental abilities and emotional state. While you sleep, your immune system produces protective infection fighting substances called cytokines. It uses these substances to combat foreign invaders such as bacteria and viruses. Long-term sleep deprivation also increases your risk of diabetes and heart disease. More on this later. The dangers of sleep deprivation are apparent on the road as well. According to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, one in every five serious motor vehicle accidents related to sleepy drivers. According to study published in 2009, there were 80,000 drivers falling asleep behind the wheel every day and 100,000 accidents every year related to sleep in the United States. So sleep deprivation, according to these studies, really mimics the effect of a drinking alcohol. Sleep deprivation also has been shown to have an effect on the hormones from your endocrine glands affecting metabolic function. Next slide. Yeah. There is nothing quite like. Oh, sorry. There's nothing quite like the sounds of your partner's deafening snore to put a strain on even the strongest of relationships. A study by the British Snoring and Sleep Apnea Association revealed that an incredible 20 million Brits are sleep deprived because their partner snores. Almost half of the Americans report snoring, according to the American Sleep Association and according to a sleep cycle study, 50% of American women report waking up from their partner snoring, so-called secondhand snoring. Now let me pass on to Jan to present findings of some of these studies on consequences of poor sleep. Over to you, Jan. Okay, thank you, Mike. So I'm gonna start with just looking at how regular we keep our time to go to sleep and to wake up. And what you have in the slide in front of you is contrasting people who have very regular sleep patterns. So that's in the upper left quadrant. You'll see those green bars. And what they indicate is that somebody is going to sleep around 1030 or so, and they sleep all the way through till about six or so in the morning. So it's a very regular sleep pattern. And down below it, you have an irregular sleeper. So you can see, then those are the red bars. And you can see on some days they go to sleep a little later, some days they go to sleep a little earlier. And so their, uh, the standard deviation, the, the change in how long they're sleeping from one night to the other, is as much as two hours or more and how long it takes for the person to actually fall asleep it can take an hour or two if you have such an irregular pattern and so what these uh investigations showed and this was published just a month ago so it's very hot off the press is that even having a very irregular sleep pattern so even if you know you're still getting on average seven or a little bit more hours of sleep if it's very irregular and it shifts back and forth, that itself can contribute to being at risk for having uh, increased risk for both cardiovascular disease as well as coronary heart disease. So these include all the things that are very common, including having a heart attack, uh, having uh, arrhythmias or atrial fibrillation, all of those kinds of, of consequences of uh, poor sleep. So irregular sleep patterns for people who 
who had more than 120 minutes of uh, variation in terms of how long they slept um, was were twice as likely to have a heart attack um, uh, or cardiovascular disease diagnosed in the next couple of years. Uh, and the same with um, how long they uh, took to fall asleep, which is the lower right panel, that it doubled the risk of having cardiovascular disease. So even the regularity of our sleep pattern is very important. Um, on this slide, what you see is on the upper left panel, both green dots and red dots. And what you see on the left with the green dots, these are um, the, the average number of hours that a person slept. So you see the leftmost uh, um, dot is less than or equal to six hours of sleep. So if any of us are sleeping, let's say five and a half hours of sleep a night, so that's where you would be. And as you get more sleep, so someone who sleeps seven hours, that's the next group over. Someone in the group that slept eight hours is the next group over. And people who slept nine or more hours a night is the next group over. And you'll see that if they had good qualities of sleep, meaning that when they fell asleep, they got into a deep sleep, slept all the way through, and in some cases only slept six hours, in other cases slept nine hours, that their hazard ratio or their risk of having uh, a problem with uh, increased uh, cardiovascular disease across the next number of years um, was a little bit elevated. You'll see the dots are above the line, the zero line there, or the one, it's called the one reference line, uh, but it's not terribly above. On the other hand, on the right where you see the red dots, so these are people who also slept those amounts of time. So less than six hours of sleep plus poor quality of sleep. Now that would mean that they might be up every hour on the hour, you know, con continuously uh, waking and falling back asleep, waking and falling back asleep. So that group were at a much higher risk of having cardiovascular disease. So the short sleepers who only had short sleep had an increased risk of cardiovascular disease by 15%. But if you had both short sleep and poor quality sleep, which is really what makes up uh, insomnia, and in some cases also apneic patients have uh, fragmented sleep or poor quality sleep. Um, so those are evidence that uh, the sleep quality matters and the sleep quantity also matters. And similarly down below, you see the risks for uh, coronary heart disease. Uh, and again, short sleep plus poor quality sleep increases the risk for coronary heart disease by 79%. So it almost doubles the risk of, um, of, of having um, some kind of cardiac problems across time. So this is usually measured in years. So for most of us, what is a sleep problem? Uh, well, for some, it could be a difficulty falling asleep. For someone else, they have no trouble falling asleep, but they have trouble waking up. So they might wake up every hour. And for others, uh, they may feel that they sleep all through the night. And yet when they wake up, it's as if they haven't felt like they slept at all. Uh, that's called non-restorative sleep. So yes, they've been in the bed and they've slept pretty much through, but the quality of the sleep that they must have been getting uh, was not good. So, so there's three different ways that we can look at poor sleep or defining poor sleep. And so the question that these researchers asked is, um, what of those uh, is important for your heart problems or for having heart problems down the road. And what you see in the box in the very middle is that if you have just one of those three, that your increased risk for having some kind of cardiac problems um, or, or acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack goes up by about 24%. Uh, if you have two of them, let's say trouble falling asleep and also very uh, non-restorative sleep, it goes up by 47%. 
And if you have all three of them, it almost doubles your risk for having a heart attack. So, so we're getting the picture that it's not only um, falling asleep that's a problem, it's staying asleep, it's feeling like the sleep itself is restorative, as well as how regular the sleep pattern is. And so how these, these sleep factors impact your heart risks are illustrated by this slide. This shows your, your, um, your blood pressure. So if you take your blood pressure, you usually get a number like 120 over 80 or something like that. And the upper two lines indicate the first number that's called the systolic number. So 120 over 80, so the 120. And this shows you insomniacs versus people who are healthy sleepers. And what you see is during the day, there's not a lot of difference between the groups, but you see at night when people go to sleep and the red bar on this um, chart shows you the moment that people fall asleep. And you see that both sleep, good sleepers and insomniacs uh, tend to have a drop in their blood pressure leading up to sleep. And that's because the body is slowing down. There's less metabolic activity. So blood pressure drops. And that's also what causes you to feel drowsy. And people that are good sleepers, you notice how much the blood pressure drops down to. And then it stays down through the night. And that's a healthy pattern. It's called a dipping phenomena and, and a dipping in blood pressure at night by something like 15 to 20 percent is a really good sign that your heart is healthy and at night it's getting the rest it needs. So the muscle is, is restoring itself and um, all of the other things that sleep does for you are happening. Uh, it also is clear with the diastolic blood pressure, um, but for the diastolic you can see that all the way through that the insomniac patients tend to be higher than the good sleeping patients, which means that what when they sleep well at night, the good sleepers actually help bring that diastolic pressure down. There's less pressure in the system. So this is just one of the ways in which sleep helps to restore those functions and, and to keep you healthy. And the last slide I wanted to show you uh, before Mike, talks about some of the uh, issues around sleep apnea. Uh, this is a very important slide. This is a slide, this was published in The Lancet, is a very uh, renowned uh, British medical journal, uh, published a good 15 years ago. And these are the um, frequency with which patients who have apnea compared to healthy controls, uh, how frequently within a 12 year period, those people who've been diagnosed with severe sleep apnea uh, would have either a heart attack or a stroke. So heart attack and stroke are very, uh, very critical medical issues. And what you see is the red line. So we'll look at the chart on the right. You see how that red line goes up higher than the other three lines. And that red line is showing how many of these people had um, a uh, non-fatal uh, cardiovascular event across the 12 year period. And you see it's about 33% or a third of this group. So all those patients who have severe apnea um, across a 12 year period, which is a long time, but their, their risk of having a heart attack or a stroke is about one in three. So that's a very, very high number. That's uh, equivalent to how smoking used to impact our risk for heart attacks. Uh, it really increased them well beyond the norm. And what's important for you to see is there's a blue line. So those are people who also have been diagnosed with severe apnea, but who are using a CPAP machine, which is the standard treatment for severe apnea. And what you see is if you do have apnea and you get the treatment that really helps to keep you breathing through the night, that your risk of a heart attack or a stroke goes all the way down pretty close to people who are, are healthy 
and, and well without any sleep problem or other medical problem um, that, that's, that's known of. So, so that's the important point is without treatment, apnea is very important uh, risk for you. Uh, with treatment, it comes down to virtually the same as controls. So let's pass it back to Mike. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the anatomy of human airway. Our upper airway is a unique multitasking structure involved in performing number of functional tasks such as swallowing, speech, swallowing of food and liquids which pass through the esophagus. That's where the food goes down. Right in front of it is our windpipe or the trachea. You can imagine how common that passage is. So normally when you breathe, air flows through your nose and mouth and down the throat into your pharynx. Have the next slide, John. Next slide. Okay. So air then flows down your windpipe into the trachea, spreading through an upside down tree-like structure, which are bronchial tubes into your lungs. Each time you breathe, suction pressure pulls the soft tissues in your pharynx inwards. The muscles in your pharynx respond by pulling the soft tissues outward again, which keeps your airway open. Next slide. When you sleep, it's normal for your muscle to relax slightly but not enough to block your airway. If you have obstructive sleep apnea, the muscles in your upper airway may relax too much. Your tongue drops into the soft tissues, pressing on the back of the throat, causing complete obstruction. The lack of oxygen caused by this suffocation wakes you up. You may gasp for air to reestablish that airflow before falling asleep again. This cycle of apnea and waking up may happen many times through the night, preventing restful sleep. Yep, that's my next slide. So repeated episodes of stopping breathing and awakening are very similar to almost drowning, as if you're gone underwater, which causes lack of oxygen called hypoxia. The brain responds to this lack of oxygen by releasing stress hormones. One of the important stress hormones is adrenaline. Next slide. Now adrenaline has multiple effects on our system. It has opposite effect to insulin. It raises blood sugar. So one is prone with sleep apnea to develop type two diabetes. It constricts blood vessels raising blood pressure through the night, triggering, triggering heart attack or stroke, typically happening around 3 a.m. Increase in heart rate, resulting in extremely irregular heartbeat, atrial fibrillation, which itself promotes slow stroke. Next slide. Also, it has an effect on the lining of the arteries called endothelium, which is smooth structure they are undisturbed lining of the blood vessel and the arteries to the brain, the heart and the legs and all the other organs, the eyes and the kidneys. And here are the immune stem cells which are floating free in the bloodstream. In people with sleep apnea, the endothelium cells become inflamed due to lack of oxygen. The immune system cells bind to move behind the endothelium layer causing inflammation of the blood vessels and these proteins shift to inside between the cells, causing further damage. Next slide. The symptoms of sleep apnea or the clues that person has sleep apnea are many. Let's go over some of them. Majority of people who have sleep apnea snores, not all, but majority. Of course, the snorer is totally unaware of snoring. 
it has to be observed snoring like the bedside partner they have complain of dry mouth because you can't snore with your mouth closed the flow of air hitting the back of the throat causes dryness awakening to urinate because the brain perceives that the lungs are flooded with water and the signals the kidneys to get rid of that excess fluid a study by the university hospital in iceland reported night sweats which were three times commoner in untreated sleep apnea awakening headaches have a strong association with sleep apnea other common symptoms are of course daytime fatigue irritability moodiness forgetfulness of course unnaturally uh, sorry of course unplanned sleeping in daytime is a consequence falling asleep in a meeting or on the subway you see people sleeping on the subway who have had a poor sleep a study conducted by the american association of sleep medicine found that patients with sleep apnea were nearly two and a half times more likely to be drivers in a motor vehicle accident now typically it happens in the early hours of morning or late in the afternoon when the brain wants to shut down the shutters and you want to have a good nap next slide sir. the diagnosis of sleep apnea unfortunately is delayed for years in a large cohort of 2000 patients there was a delay of almost 20 years between the onset of symptoms of sleep apnea and referral for a sleep study this was either due to symptoms being ignored and snoring just considered a nuisance or even a normal phenomena in a family we inherit our throat anatomy which can be conducted which can be conducive to sleep apnea misrepresentation of symptoms is not uncommon examples being in women sweating through the night considered to be due to menopausal symptoms frequent waking up to urinate in men gets labeled as due to prostate problems when it comes to the resulting effects of sleep apnea poor control of high blood pressure and diabetes becomes the focus rather than the contributing cause of sleep apnea so that disease starts being treated with a poor control needing multiple medications for control of high blood pressure multiple medications to control diabetes unless sleep apnea is treated i want to stress the role of an observant bed partner reporting intermittent cessation of breathing that's very critical okay over to you john for diagnosis of sleep how the diagnosis is made okay thank you mike so very very importantly um most people when they fall asleep are not going to be observing very very much about what their sleep is doing almost by definition because once you fall asleep you're unconscious and you can't observe anything so it's it's the as mike uh, you were suggesting the bed partner is very important in observing uh, if they do wake up that you've stopped breathing and often that's uh, uh, evident from the cessation of breathing and then once you start again there's that kind of uh, really loud um, <clears throat> beginning of the breath so if you have any of those uh, signals that you might have sleep apnea we highly recommend that you go for a sleep test now it's called a sleep test but I've been for one, I do have apnea myself, I use a CPAP every night, and having gone through the test, I can tell you that it's probably not the best name for it because you're going to sleep in a place where you're not familiar, there may be noises in the next room as the techs are going about their business, there may be someone sleeping in the next room over who is snoring, so there's a lot of things that might wake you up. Uh, but that's okay. You do not have to sleep through the whole night in order to get good information that tells them whether you might have sleep apnea or not. So one of the things that that is happening when you are in the lab is that they hook you up with various leads, collecting information 
on what is your brain doing? What are your eye movements doing? What kind of airflow is, is observed near the nose? Um, is there any, um, is there, are there times when the, the muscles of the neck and below are, are non-responsive, meaning they just stop functioning? Uh, because all of these things give the sleep clinic a clue as to what stage of sleep you're in, and in particular, what may be disturbing your sleep. So they're very interested in what your body is doing when it should be sleeping. And so all of these sources of information are kind of being collected, and then they look to see what's the pattern, what is it that is, is happening. Um, as you go down the list here, the most important of these measures is called the oxygen saturization index, or O2 sat, and that tells them what's the percentage of oxygen in your bloodstream as you are trying to um, sleep and, and be in bed all night. It also tells them whether you're making the effort to breathe uh, or not, uh, as the oxygen levels may be dropping, and whether your legs are moving in any way. So all of that is important. And here's how it would look um, with all of the various um, uh, measures kind of being in place. So as I said, it may be that you don't sleep as well as you sleep at home, and that's okay, because they're collecting information that tells them where's the problem, what is it that's happening. And on this particular slide, so this shows you all of the leads that they're collecting information on. And for sleep apnea, the most important measure is what's your oxygen level, because if your oxygen level begins to drop, it's creating for the body a serious problem a life-threatening problem. And so cardiologists will say that oxygen level should stay above 92% all night. So as you go to sleep and stay asleep, your oxygen level should be at 92% to 99%. Um, and that's fine. That doesn't present a big problem for the, for the patient or the body. But as soon as it drops down into the 80s, and in some cases down into the 70s, uh, that is a life-threatening situation, and that is what the body has to wake up for uh, to, to begin to get you breathing again. So on this diagram, the very bottom of the diagram, you'll see is labeled SAO2, saturation of oxygen, and as you go across, you'll see that in this particular um, person who, whose sleep was measured for, th for five minutes, that it drops down to 75%. Then the person wakes up. Uh, you can see the, the big movements, the jerky movements above there um, that indicate the, the body is getting the signal from the nervous system, wake up or you're going to die. And it goes back up to 94%. But then as the person falls asleep again, and that upper airway blocks again, as Mike described, uh, then you get the oxygen level dropping down a second time, they recover again, and the third time it drops down and it stays down for a long time before the person is awoken uh, and recovers. So all of these repeated times that the oxygen level is dropping is causing problems for the body and for the brain. And here's an example of oxygen levels and which are indicated on the top and you see in this red box this is when this particular person is going into rapid eye movement sleep and so when you go into rapid eye movement sleep your body is paralyzed from the neck down which makes it harder to breathe it makes it harder to pull the air past that blockage and you can see that oxygen levels really suffer when you go into that rapid eye movement period and on the bottom you see the pulse the heart rate that responds so as the oxygen levels have dropped up above you can see the spikes that are occurring in the heart rate so this is your nervous system kind of firing to get the heart to get you to breathe again uh, which it does it successfully gets you to breathe again but the cost of it is using the stress system over and over and over again in the middle of the night where it was never really intended to be used and in the same sleeper so this is around 4 30 at night and in the same sleeper this is now a little bit later around 6 30 uh, 
oops, sorry, about 6.30, you see that on the bottom chart where the pulse is indicated, it, it's uh, at around 60 to 70 beats per minute for a long time. And then right around, um, I guess it's just before seven o'clock, all of a sudden the heart rate goes down, it drops. This is called bradycardia. So this is where the heart is feeling in crisis, that it's struggling to maintain the, the oxygen levels. And so it slows everything down in order to keep you um, alive, basically. So when we're not sleeping well, there's a number of things that begin to happen. Uh, the one that most of us will notice is fatigue. And um, there are other things that also happen. You get a little bit more moody. Uh, your appetite can change. You start to eat or nibble at things, especially late in the day or before bedtime. Uh, and concentration, our ability to focus our thoughts is something that are, is reported by many, many patients. And what this chart shows here, this is a study that was done on higher cognitive abilities, being able to remember things, being able to respond quickly to things, uh, solving problems. And what it shows is that we are actually at our very best uh, at that point in the middle where there's a line, that dotted line, which falls at around uh, seven hours and 15 minutes. So if you can sleep for seven hours and 15 minutes, your cognitive functions are going to be the best that they are uh, through, you know, uh, alternate times of sleep. And this was study conducted with thousands of uh, people, young and old, and collecting information on how they slept the night before and their, their, their performance on different tasks. Um, and what you see is definitely your thinking is affected by poor sleep. Over to you, Mike. Okay, so apart from sleep apnea, there are of course other causes of sleep deprivation. Let's look at the personal choice. Some people don't realize that the body needs adequate sleep. Instead of regularly going to bed at a reasonable hour, they prefer to stay up late to socialize, watch all the 10 episodes of a movie on Netflix, or get absorbed in reading a book. Next was poor sleep hygiene. Some people's habits are disruptive. For example, drinking coffee or smoking a cigarette close to bedtime, which stimulates the nervous system and makes sleep less likely. Another common problem is lying in bed and worrying about the day past or about next day rather than relaxing. Next slide. Next is poor, sorry. People who do shift work disrupt their sleep-wake cycle on a regular basis. Healthcare workers, particularly during the COVID-19 season. Frequent travelers, for example, airline crew, also tend to have erratic sleeping habits. Next. Health issues. We have all experienced consequences of a cold or a stuffy nose during allergy season with snoring and gagging with a post-nasal drip, which has a direct effect on sleep fragmentation. Other causes include heartburn, congestive heart failure, COPD, aches and pains from musculoskeletal causes, such as arthritis or fibromyalgia, menopausal symptoms, which have a direct effect on sleep by fragmenting it and diabetes and kidney disease to mention a few. Some of the medications have a direct effect on sleep such as steroids, drugs used for anxiety or depression, substance abuse diuretics are obviously common causes of sleep deprivation. Next slide. The sleeping environment. Sleep may be disrupted for a range of environmental reasons because the bedroom is too hot or too cold or because of the noisy neighbors, or a disruptive pet in the bedroom, or a young baby sleeping in with the parents. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Jan. Okay, thank you, Mike. So, okay, there we go. <clears throat> so, 
one of the things that <clears throat> they're very interested in when you do a sleep study is what kind of brain activity do they notice? And what this chart shows you is on the upper part, you see a waking brain rhythm is very busy. It's going up and down very quickly because you're collecting all kinds of information through your senses. <clears throat> and the brain is, is tabulating all of that and integrating it. And as you go into a very light sleep, you'll notice that it kind of slows down a little bit and there's an appearance of what are called alpha rhythms, which is kind of when you're kind of slow, much more relaxed. Uh, when people meditate, there's more alpha rhythm in their brain waves. It's a very relaxed kind of uh, sensation. And as you go into a middle level of sleep, now you have some events called sleep spindles or K-complex, as you see these you know, sort of surges of activity in the brain, which basically means that in the deep part of the brain, there's waves that start there and kind of go up towards the, the prefrontal cortex and they're carrying information. So things that you learned in the daytime, things that you were doing that you want to remember are stored in short-term memory in your hippocampus. And those, those, uh, those sleep, sleep spindles and K-pomp complexes are moving the information up to long-term memory so that you remember things uh, and all of this is happening while you're sleeping and then as you get into a deep sleep you have what are called delta waves which are almost like ocean waves really long slow rhythms and and so those are present in the deepest part of sleep and then every 90 minutes or so you go into what's called a rapid eye movement sleep period or REM period. So you can kind of take a look at how these look like uh, on a chart. So if you kind of graph, and if we look at the bottom graph here, you see the, the kinds of brain waves that are present. And for a normal sleeper, they're awake usually for about 15 or 20 minutes after they turn the light out. And then they kind of find that their brain waves start dropping down into the alpha rhythms and then a little deeper into the theta with the sleep spindles and capa complex, and then finally into delta sleep, stages three and four. And you stay in that pattern for about an hour and a half, 90 minutes or so, and then you come up into a rapid eye movement phase. So that cycle is about 90 minutes long. And then at the end of that, there's a point where you could wake up or go back into sleep. And most of the time for many of us, that after that first 90 minute cycle, we'll go back into a second 90 minute cycle. And you can see there's a little bit less of the deeper sleep and a little bit longer REM period. And then if you go into a third cycle, there's even less of the deeper sleep and more REM and so on until you wake up in the morning. And so these cycles are allowing the brain to reorganize its information so that when you start the day in the morning, uh, you have a completely different map of who you are and what's important to you. So it's as if your brain is completely uh, sort of reorganized at night so that you can start the next day fresh. And that short-term memory system that was holding those memories, they've now been moved up to the long-term memory. So it kind of gets erased and you can start the day learning something new and getting through the next day. Now in insomnia, what we know is that the person is experiencing a lot of sympathetic arousal. So that means the fight or flight system or your stress system is overly active and the brain is in a state where it's afraid of something bad happening. And so what you see in these cycles of activity is they, they begin to fall apart. So for one thing, you'll notice that a person with insomnia may take an hour or two before they even fall asleep. And that's because that, that uh, hyper arousal is, it's like traveling in a car at 100 miles an hour. You, you can't just jump off of it or get off of it. You have to slow the car down before you can get into sleep. And even once you get into sleep, you'll notice that it doesn't have that same deep sleep that the person who's a good sleeper has. 
uh, and there are REM periods, but they tend to be shorter, and the person tends to wake up, sometimes in the middle of that 90-minute cycle, sometimes at the end of the REM sleep. So that's what defines insomnia, is trouble falling asleep, waking up repeatedly in the middle of the night, or waking up too early in the morning. And what we now understand is that someone who has insomnia, there are areas of the brain that, that handle all kinds of emotion. Fear and, and anxiety is one of those, but other kinds of emotions like sadness, uh, you know, worry, um, loneliness, etc., are also activated. And for insomniacs, because they're not getting into the deep sleep and into rapid eye movement sleep, they're not allowing those those emotional centers to kind of get reset and to be set back down to normal. Whereas normal sleepers, you can see on this chart, those areas of the brain that activate and process emotional memories get really renewed so that you're starting the next day fresh. So we now get to, I guess, the most important point for all of you, and that would be, you know, how would you rate your own sleep? And what we have here is a very simple uh, and scientifically validated measure of healthy sleep. And what we've, what the author, Daniel Busey from uh, uh, Philadelphia uh, Sleep Center has put together is the six most often uh, cited ways that sleep begins to break down and, and not help us in uh, in functioning the best that we can each day. So for each of you, you can kind of consider answering each of these six questions. Do you wake up at the same time or within an hour of that time every morning? So let's say seven o'clock in the morning, if that's your usual time. Um, do you wake up at that time every single day for seven days out of the week? Is that rarely or never, sometimes, usually or always? So the more often you can keep to a regular wake up time, as we saw earlier, the healthier it is for your heart and for your 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 day to day functioning. Do you feel satisfied with your sleep? So this really has to do with your sleep quality. Um, even though you haven't been through a sleep lab to look at what your brain is doing, you'll kind of have a sense of whether you feel that sleep is serving you well or it isn't. And how satisfied are you? Is that rarely, never, sometimes, or usually? Um, do you stay awake all day without dozing? So this is really a measure of how alert you can stay. And if your sleep pattern has been good enough, then it should sustain you for 16 hours of activity. So that's the rule of thumb, is once you've finished your sleep, you should be able to function for 16 hours without necessarily taking a nap. Uh, it does change a bit as we get into our mid 70s and 80s in that our nighttime sleep gets to be a little bit more difficult. We wake up a little earlier because of circadian rhythms that change and often we can complement that with an afternoon nap uh, which is definitely cardio protective so uh, we're not discouraging people from taking a short nap in the afternoon uh, but if you're younger than 75 you should be able to sustain a full day of activity um, and is your sleep time when you're with that block of sleep that you do get does it kind of center itself between two and 4 a.m. So here we're looking at, are you sleeping mainly when it's dark outside? So if you go to sleep around 11 at night and wake up at seven in the morning, okay, that means you're sleeping mainly in the time that it's dark. And that's a good thing. That seems to be very healthy. Um, and how much time do you spend awake at night, both in the time it takes you to fall asleep or the time that you're up in the middle of the night after awakening. So if that's 30 minutes or longer on some or all of those nights, that's not healthy for you. And do you sleep between six and eight hours per day? So that's what we're aiming for. Uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has suggested for all adults that we should aim to sleep seven hours or more each night. So depending on your ratings here, you can give yourself a score um, between one or I guess zero. Well, no, if you get, if you score it 
um, 0, 1, and 2, then the lowest would be 0 and the highest would be 12 in terms of your score. And you want to get up to as close as you can to 12 on the scale. So these are the things that we hope you've learned from our presentation. Uh, we're sure you have questions uh, and things that are important for you to ask. So we'll help you or we'll, we'll address some of those questions at this point. And um, it looks like we have some questions that have come in. Uh, so the first question is, Changes in schedule of daily activity have huge impacts to all body systems. So that's the circulatory, the neuro, the endocrine, musculoskeletal, et cetera. That's true. All of your body systems are going to be impacted um, by changes in schedule. All of these will diminish the body's immunity capacities. So I guess the question is, how does it impact that? Um, open to, okay. All right. So Mike, do you um, want to take a stab at this in terms of how the body uses sleep to renew itself? Yes. So the body has, the body and mind go hand in hand. So what happens in the brain level, it affects every organ in the body, the heart, the liver, the blood sugar, the blood pressure, including the immune system. I uh, mentioned about cytokines, which are regulated by our sleep rhythm. So if you are tired, you are more likely, for example, to get a flu, simple flu, you're more likely to. People often observe that if they're tired, they really need a good sleep to get over it. So that's how the immune system works. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question I think is really appropriate for this time that we're all going through. Uh, and, and the comment is patients have fears of the existent disease and the inability to continue their rehab program during this unprecedented time. Um, and then the combination of lack of physical exercise exercise, self-isolation, uh, perhaps inappropriate diet choices, um, uh, lack of socialization, being uh, alone and, and losing that ability to have face-to-face -face communication. All of that can change the body's biorhythm. Uh, and because of that, we wake up later or earlier, go to bed earlier or later and change our sleeping hours. Um, and that in turn, is a higher risk for cardiac events. Uh, and all of that is true. And the question is, what can we do? So I agree completely with what you've said there. And the way to think of it is this, that for the, for the brain especially, uh, danger trumps everything. And so this goes back to basic survival. If a bear kind of popped up in front of you, if you're walking through the woods, and all of a sudden there was a bear on the path in front of you, okay, hopefully you would instantly react, meaning that you would recognize this is a danger to my life, and your nervous system would shift into what's called sympathetic arousal or, or um, hyper arousal, where you feel your heart rate beating quickly, adrenaline is, is dumped into the bloodstream, and you start to feel your body temperature increase. So, and that gives you this surge of energy in order to run away from the bear, or if you have to, do something to protect yourself. And so that is a very effective way for surviving from many of the predators that we've faced in our uh, long history on this earth. So it's a, it's a system that works beautifully if the problem is a bear on the path that you're on. But if the problem is something like COVID-19, which really is kind of all around and yet it's not directly in front of you, and it's, but it's activating the same stress system, that what you do have to understand that an important task you have is to begin to manage those reactions. And, and the way in which I usually try to help patients manage it is first of all, 
by telling them their body and brain are doing what's normal. This, this is what it has learned to do across millions of years. So this is normal for it to do. But because there is no bear, and you're not gonna be running away from it, which means you're not gonna be burning up all of those stress hormones. You have to find out alternative ways of managing your stress, because if you do nothing, those hormones kind of just sit there and they will affect your ability to get to sleep at night. So doing something like going out for a walk, uh, learning exercises, uh, different things like meditation, uh, breathing exercises, muscle relaxation exercises, um, learning to connect with others through Zoom or other Skype or other kinds of uh, video chats uh, can really help in modulating our, our feelings because when we talk about them, if we can connect with a good friend, talk about what we're feeling, oftentimes we'll notice that those reactions begin to dissipate. So those are some of the things that you just have to kind of understand are important for you to be doing because you just can't wait for it to dissipate. It typically won't just turn off or it will eventually, but it, it takes quite a long time. Um, the next question comes to us. Uh, it's about melatonin. How often can you take melatonin? What is a reasonable dose? Mike, do you want to try this one? Yeah. Typically, on a shelf in the pharmacy, melatonin comes in two shapes. One is sublingual. You take 33 milligrams tablet under the tongue, which is for a quick knockout. Or there's a longer acting, five milligrams, usually combined with, five, with magnesium. Magnesium is to avoid any restless legs or leg cramps people have at night. Now, most people find it very effective, the sublingual uh, uh, melatonin, which I would really suggest for using. It's a quick action. Okay. Um, here's the next question. How does uh, tinnitus affect sleep? And if it does, are there any solutions? Oh, that's a really good question. So for those of you who aren't familiar with tinnitus, it's um, a ringing in the ears. And the actual volume of that sound to the person can vary uh, within the person. Some days it can be worse, some days it can be better. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's quite distracting. So if that ringing in the ears is quite extent, quite high, um, and it's there when you're trying to sleep, uh, it will uh, clearly disrupt your sleep pattern. Um, are there any solutions? It is a pattern that's difficult to change. Um, I've run a stress group where I teach people skills like breathing exercises, muscle relaxation, imagery. Um, they can be helpful to some degree, um, but I haven't really noticed that uh, it would completely, uh, teaching yourself to relax will completely remove that symptom. So um, there may be other things that you can explore, maybe medical um, treatments, I don't know. Uh, Mike, would you have any idea about that? Yes, I'm a tinnitus sufferer throughout my life. So I have learned to develop strategies. For example, I will put a soft music at night before I go to sleep. Um, that helps. Or focusing on your breathing, distract your mind's attention. That's very helpful. And I use tinnitus sometimes as a method to put me to sleep. I can focus it on and use it to put me to sleep. Use it to the proper method. But I have suffered it for years and there is no real remedy. No medication okay. for sure. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm glad that you had a chance to answer that. <laughs> okay, the next question, can a positive change to sleeping patterns undo harm from a long period of poor sleep patterns? Um, partially, yes, but not completely. So, for example, if for years you've had sleep apnea, um, it is going to affect a number of things, and I can 
tell a little bit about my own experience, uh, not with tinnitus, but with apnea. So when I was diagnosed with apnea five years ago, I did have problems with uh, low back pain that came and went. Uh, I did have periodic nights where I'd have to go to the washroom uh, at night. Um, across time, I was finding my energy levels were reduced. And so now that I've used the CPAP machine every night, um, those things have improved. So the back pain is generally gone. Once in a while, I may still do something physical that aggravates it, but it's rare. Um, the general energy that I have through most days is, is vastly improved. Uh, even the amount of sleep that I get at night. So when I first started using my CPAP machine, I was sleeping six hours a night. And I did get up to, and I still sleep now, seven hours a night, most nights. But it took 18 months of using the machine every night for six hours plus for the sleep drive to kind of actually slowly get up to seven hours. So, so these are not things that will change on a dime. But if you stick with it, uh, there are a whole series of changes that the brain is able to make uh, and to get out of that um, danger um, kind of reaction. Um, a wonderful book I should mention at this point is a book called Why We Sleep, and it talks a lot about the things that, that can improve if you change your sleep patterns. Uh, Why We Sleep is written by Matthew Walker. He's one of the premier um, sleep researchers in the world. He's now at Stanford. He was at Harvard, so he knows what he's talking about. The book is beautifully written, very easy to, to get engaged in, and, and so I would recommend it highly. The next question, do you think blue light glasses have any effect? Okay, so those of you who don't know, blue light glasses are called blue blockers. And the reason that you, they're kind of like sunglasses and you would put them on in the evening, maybe an hour or two before you go to bed because it's that blue light that tells the brain that, light, that it's light outside and we should stay awake. So the reason you're going to put them on is to trick the brain into thinking it's not light outside. Um, and that in turn starts the brain to slow down and get you ready for sleep. So it can be very helpful if you're a night owl. Uh, and they do help many people, uh, but you do need to put them on at least two hours, sometimes a little bit more before you're planning to go to sleep. Uh, and if you're doing other, let's say, exciting things like watching a very uh, interesting movie, it's not enough to get you to sleep just by putting those blockers on. Uh, you also have to be doing activities that are calming and relaxing to support that change in the light. Um, okay, next question. Uh, this might be one for you, Mike. I have ringing in ears, but, uh, but it's during the day. Is this normal? Yes, so that sometimes is very true. The tinnitus is obvious during the day, but it gets sort of less obvious during the night, which is really the opposite which you will think. So that's just a different pattern of uh, ringing in the ears. Okay, thank you. And one last question, and then we'll wrap it up for today. Um, can you send and the link for breathing properly. And um, I did answer some questions. So if you go to the Cardiac College website, and I believe it's one of the last questions, I sent a link for doing breathing if you're more of a chest breather. Uh, there's a specific kind of exercise you do for that. And if you're more of an abdominal or belly breather, uh, there's another exercise you can do uh, for that. So just go to the website and you'll see the links for that and uh, good luck with that. So thank you all for attending. We've um, gone our full hour. Uh, we appreciate your time in uh, attending. So hopefully this was helpful to you and um, uh, we look forward to uh, seeing people tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to have uh, Dr. Paul O and Rob Bertelink talk about how your heart works. Uh, very important session. I would highly recommend it. Both really know their stuff, and it's uh, an important session. Thank so. you all for your participation. Have a great day. Stay safe.
exactly. Take care. Bye.